Good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Expert Dialogue, Episode 3, Opportunity and Challenge in Post-Vaccination Era, presented by One for Biotech and Renxing Association. First of all, thank you all for taking your time out and being here today. This is Jojo Chow from One for Biotech, and I will be moderating this webinar. We may know that there are about seven severe epidemics suffered in human history. People from all over the world fought against the epidemic by all means. Though the outcomes for ending the epidemic were painful as millions of people have been died, we ultimately gained more knowledge on how to effectively controlling the spread of epidemic as well as finding a way out to end the disaster. There is a saying that it is a way to mitigate the spread of epidemic only if you acquire the knowledge about the disease and share it to other people. I believe that we already revealed parts of mystery about COVID-19. However, those are far away from the paranormal of the disease. As one of the strongest measures to heal the world from COVID pandemic, COVID-19 vaccine has been firstly applied in United Kingdom since last December. Up to date, there are around 4 billion doses have been administered globally, and 30 million people are now administered each day. Vaccination becomes the hotspot topic in our daily life. In the meanwhile, lots of concerns and questions also brought up in this special moment. Therefore, to address these questions, here we invited two experts in this field to share their insights on the opportunities and challenges in the post-vaccination era. Now, please, please allow me to introduce our speaker. The first one is Professor Dr. Rafiq Kaani from Pakistan. He's the president of Pakistan Infection Control Society and director of Save Kovas, City Lab Advance, Hasmanis, and Global Labs. He will talk about the COVID vaccination, neutralizing antibody after vaccination and recovery from COVID-19 infection. Dr. Rafiq, you can say hi to our audience. Hi. Hi, everybody. Thank you. And the second one is Dr. Yan Zhao Zhang from Japan. He's a researcher of Japanese National Institute of Infectious Disease and lecturer of Tokyo Medical and Dental University. He will talk about the society coexisting with the new corona, Japanese corona research and policy. Dr. Zhang, please say hi to our audience. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Zhang from Japan. Welcome. Uh, it's a pleasure to have this opportunity to speak to uh, our experts online. Thank you, Dr. Zhang. Thank both of you for joining us today. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping notes to ensure the best audio quality. Please turn your volume up. At the end of the webinar, we will have a QA section. So if you have any question during the presentation, you can either submit your question to the QA section or directly add them to the chat box. Me and my colleague will short these questions out and deliver them to our experts. If you miss anything, also don't worry. A record version of this webinar will be uploaded to YouTube, one for official account. Now, let's get straight to the content. Professor Dr. Rafiq, please go ahead. Okay, thank you for your nice and kind introduction. And uh, uh, it's, it's good morning and good afternoon and good, good evening because we are all in different uh, time zones. I'm at the moment in uh, uh, San Jose, United States. And uh, it's almost uh, 4 a.m. in the morning. So the time we planned was the 4 p.m in Pakistan when we scheduled this meeting. So I welcome all of you and let me allow screen sharing. Dr. Rafi, you can share your screen. Yes. So I will <clears throat> start with the program for today and I talk about the global scenario of COVID as of yesterday. The world is at a, at a perilous point in this pandemic today. We have just passed the tragic milestone of 4 million 
recorded COVID-19 deaths and more than 188 million confirmed infections. But this is a, still a gross, gross underestimates because there are countries in which it's very difficult to find out the cause of the death and record it accordingly. Now, some countries with the highest vaccination coverage are now planning to roll out booster shots in the coming months and are removing the public health social measures like social distancing and other hygienic measures and quarantine. So they are trying to relax it. And the false impression is that the pandemic is already over, but it is not. It's not for most of the world. So, however, compounded by fast moving variants and shocking inequity in the vaccination, far too many countries in every region of the world are seeing sharp spikes in cases and hospitalization. This is, is a map which I <clears throat> took out yesterday and over here you can see that there are major regions in the world which are worstly affected. The number of cases are still, although there is some decline all over the world, but it is not significant. And uh, in some countries, the vaccines which are rolled out, the number of vaccine jabs that have been administered so far are about 3.4 billion. So I like to talk about that vaccination is the only strategy by which we can control or contain the epidemic of this proportion. And we are fortunate enough to have developed the vaccines just within six months of this pandemic. That's all right. Yes. That's perfect. Sorry for interruption. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, because uh, in we we don't see your screaming your uh, PPT. You can't you see my screen sharing? Sorry, we can't see your PPT. Is it now? Yeah, it's okay. Okay. Yeah. Is it okay now? Yes. Okay. So I, I was talking about the global scenario. At, at this point, more than 4 million deaths have occurred so far globally. More than 188 million people have been confirmed suffering from or diagnosed as the COVID-19 sufferers. Uh, there are certain parts of the world in which the epidemic is on, as on some decline. Most of the regions in which it is on decline is due to the effective vaccination. But still there, the majority of the world is on the epidemic and the number of the cases and number of infections are on the rise. Now the antibodies which are produced either in response to infection or due to vaccine, they are protecting us from disease. And the scientists have found out that once somebody has got the infection, Naturally, the body produces antibodies, and these antibodies may be humoral antibodies or cellular antibodies. Both of these work together to either get rid of the virus and to prevent the complications of the disease. One antibody which we have later on found out that's known as neutralizing antibodies. There are several antibodies. There is a plethora of antibodies that are produced against the virus, COVID-19, if it enters the body. 
So it's the IgM antibodies, IgG antibodies, IgA antibodies, Id antibodies against the surface proteins, antibodies against nucleoproteins, nucleocapsids, antibodies against various components of the virus are produced. But all these antibodies are not protective in nature. So the antibodies which are protective in nature, we call them neutralizing antibodies. And we know that the virus, when virus enters the body, it can attach to the body and enter our cell through the S2 receptors. These S2 receptors are found in the respiratory epithelium as well as elsewhere. So when virus enters, you can see in this cartoon, that this spike protein of the virus has got an area that is known as receptor binding domain, RBD. And the virus finds the S2 receptor and gets attached to it. And this allows entry of the virus into the cell, into the human cell or the host cell. So if somehow we can block this association or attachment of the virus to the S2 receptors, we can prevent this infection. So the antibodies which can prevent this infection are known as neutralizing antibodies. And over here in this diagram, you can see that the antibodies, if these antibodies are produced by two ways. One is by natural infection and another is by administration of the vaccines. So once the administ we administer the vaccine, the large number of antibodies are formed and these block the association or attachment of the virus on the epithelium. Now neutralizing antibodies prevent infection and this is a diagram which can clearly explain that this is a virus particle with the spike proteins S1 and S2 having a receptor binding domain. And due to the production of the antibodies, either following the natural infection or following the vaccine administration, this, these antibodies block the entry of the virus into the cell. The other measures which we use like social distancing, etc., work, but they are ineffective and humanly impossible to maintain for a longer period of time because human beings are social animals and the life cannot go on if we continue social distancing and isolating everybody. Now, there is an ongoing COVID-19 pandemic and that's continued to causing millions of new infections on a daily basis. And vaccination is the most effective strategy to control the pandemic. Now, there are questions that comes to mind when we talk about the immunity. Immunity following the infection. If somebody is infected with the COVID coronavirus or SARS-CoV-2, the immunity generally lasts eight months, six to eight months. Similarly, if we administer the vaccine, the immunity may last six to eight months, but some declining immunity may continue for one to two years or sometimes maybe up to 10 years. That is what our calculation based on the half-life of the antibodies in human body suggest that the partial immunity may last for up to 10 years. So it has been noticed, noticed that sometimes the vaccine dried immunity is much stronger compared to the natural infection. But this may not be always the case. And that depends upon two factors. One are the factors that are associated with the vaccine production and the quality of the vaccine and other are the host factors. Not every host react by forming the antibodies to the equal level. So the purpose of vaccination is of course, protecting the community and the vaccine manufacturers over last six, eight months, since we started vaccinating people 
from August 2020, we have learned about so many new variants that are coming out from different parts of the world. And one variant is <coughs> replacing the other variant. So scientists and the vaccine manufacturers are exploring whether or not the vaccines will require the booster doses or they will require the genetic modifications to respond to the new variants. Now, the immunity produced either by natural infection or by the vaccine, there are several grades of this immune immunity or immune response. So very, all the vaccines which are so far allowed and WHO has agreed and recommended these vaccines, all of these vaccines work well and prevent both either symptomatic disease or severe disease in the short term to medium term. And there is a decline in the effectiveness of vaccine over a period of time because the antibodies that are produced, they decay gradually. So we will discuss all about it. So when somebody is infected, there are few things that may happen. Either the infection remains totally asymptomatic and the person may even do not know that that person is infected. Then, so these we call asymptomatic. Some of these people which are asymptomatic may become pre-symptomatic over the next few days. Majority of the people fall in this group which are either asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic. Then there are mild cases in which there is fever and sometimes cough, uh, body pains and so on and so forth. Then there are cases which have got moderate, mod <coughs> moderate illness. And that moderate illness means that they suffer a few days, uh, have some respiratory difficulties. Sometimes they may require oxygen therapy. Then there are severe illness cases which require hospitalization and assisted oxygen therapy. And then there are few people who end up in critical condition intensive care units and may require the oxygen, assisted oxygen therapy. So all these stages of disease can be prevented to some or the other extent through the vaccine or through the immunity. Now this slide is very important. I would like to focus you, I would request to focus on this slide that immunity against the COVID-19 infection and protection from severe disease. So the protection afforded by the vaccine or by the natural infection can be graded into five levels. One is the maximum level of protection. That virus is unable, you are exposed to the virus, but the virus is unable to cause infection in that person. So this is the maximum level of protection. And our vaccination strategy, we really target this maximum protection so that the virus should not spread into the community. Then there is sub-maximal vaccine protection that the infection occurs, but the person may remain asymptomatic or have minor symptoms. Then there is an optimum level of protection in which infection occurs, there is a moderate disease, but that disease does not require assisted or supplemented oxygen therapy or hospitalization. Then there is a minimal level of protection in which the infection occurs and the complications are serious and person may require assisted oxygen therapy and hospitalization. And there is a level which we call, there is no protection. So with the vaccine and with following the infection, immunity may give you no protection or it may give you the maximum protection. And our, our objective is to get the maximum protection. So antibody levels translate to high level of protection from disease. How can we know that the vaccine that has been administered is effective. 
and will protect you. So to find out this, we really need to find, we really need to do certain testing by which, because no vaccine is 100% effective. The efficacy of the vaccine ranges from somewhere between 60, from 60% to 100%. But if somebody who has been given a vaccine does not fall into those 60, 70 or 80% people who are protected, how are we going to know? So the tests that we do it are the measurement of the neutralizing antibodies. So if somebody has got the neutralizing antibodies, it means it is a reflection that the person is protected. And when somebody will require a booster dose, again, we can find it out if there is a decline in the antibody level, neutralizing antibody level to the extent that this person needs the booster dose. Half-life of the neutralizing antibodies in human blood is 108 days, almost 3.5 months. So if somebody has got an antibody level of say 2000 international units today, after three and a half months, this will decrease to 500. From 1000, it will decline to 500 after three and a half months and so on and so forth. So after every three and a half months, the antibody level will reduce to half. But after two years, it is assumed that it will, the decay will slow down. However, there are other factors other than neutralizing antibodies, which are immune memory. There are factors other than the specific immunity like innate immunity of that individual. There are several other host factors and viral attributes, which ultimately determine the kind of protection or the severity of the disease. Uh, this paper appeared <coughs> in Nature Medicine last month that the neutralizing antibody levels are highly predictive of immune protection from symptomatic SARS-CoV disease. So that was a very interesting <coughs> paper and that has analyzed several studies and concluded that, that neutralizing antibodies should always be checked to see that whether vaccine is working or not. So it in fact serves as an immune proxy measurement for the protection and safety of that individual. Then another paper that questioned that the do neutralizing antibodies titers foretell us the immune protection against COVID-19. And this article described very well that how and why these neutralizing antibodies are protecting us or the persons who are vaccinated and they've taken up the vaccine. So there is a difference between a vaccinated individual and whether the vaccine has really been able to increase your immunity, to boost your immunity. So they, these are the few papers that appeared over the last couple of months. Now, how do we measure these neutralizing antibodies? This is a big question. So there are, of course, several techniques like enzyme immunoassays, the viral neutralizing assays, uh, lateral flow, chemiluminescence, or CLIA. So ELISA, CLIA, rapid, or lateral flow tests and so on and so forth. So several techniques are available. Some of the techniques require uh, sophisticated laboratory equipment. Others do not require the sophisticated equipment and they can be done in the field condition even. So depending upon the situation and the availability, different techniques may be used. By, by far the most 
easy and uh, a, a reproducible technique. We call it rapid lateral flow tests for the detection of SARS-CoV neutralizing antibodies. So as I mentioned that we should not assume that if the vaccine has been administered, whether the protection is there or not. So nowadays, of course, the World Health Organization or Centers of Disease Control, they do not recommend checking the antibody levels because for the public health, it is very difficult for the countries and for the nations not only to provide the jabs and the vaccines to everybody, but to check for their immune response. So that's why at this stage in epidemic, they do not recommend checking for the neutralizing antibody tests. But to a certain level, for example, people who are working in the healthcare sector, and if they think that they have given their vaccine and they start thinking that they are protected, and they get the exposed to it, exposed to the to the infection, and they suffer from disease because they were unable to produce neutralizing antibodies. So this is a great challenge and it's a great problem. Several papers have appeared in the last couple of months, which clearly mentioned that a number of healthcare workers who were vaccinated fully, they suffered not only from the infection but severe disease and some of them died of it. So that's why it's very, very important for those people who are likely to be exposing themselves to the new infection to check whether their antibody levels are at sufficient level or not. So just to, uh, now coming to the scenario in Pakistan, there are eight vaccines which are available in Pakistan. And all these include the Sinopharm, Sinovac, Moderna, AstraZeneca, uh, Pfizer, Antibio, and Parkvac. Some vaccines are of course two dose regimes, some are single dose regimes. Now, this, the testing of the serology, how do we use it in our practices and clinical practice? It's to find out herd immunity. We really need to test for the neutralizing antibodies in a sample of population. Similarly, immunity passport. If somebody has to either travel or go to a restaurant or somewhere where there is a gathering, the immunity passport are the certificates which clearly mention that this person has got a neutralizing antibodies, they are vaccinated and they have got the neutralizing antibodies. So these people may be allowed to enter either on that flight or in the gatherings. So vaccine efficacy, if you are testing a new vaccine, how will you find it out? check for the neutralizing antibodies. So neutralizing antibodies are the most important tests to ascertain the status of the person as far as the protection from COVID-19 is concerned. As I mentioned that there are several techniques available and some of the techniques, particularly with the lateral flow can do the visual reading. And I was looking at the literature and uh, validity of certain tests and I found out that the one for uh, even visual tests for the COVID-19 neutralizing antibody produces good color on the strips or on the test cassettes. Uh, similarly, if there is a measurement that is required for qualitative test, quantitative test, and semi-quantitative test. The qualitative test, we can do the visual reading and find out if that person has got sufficient level of neutralizing antibodies. But to ascertain it semi-quantitatively, we can do the measurement through either the fluorescence or through the computer-generated 
images. So fine care receptor binding domain antibody tests provide that kind of semi-quantitative as well as quantitative measurement of the antibodies. So that has been tested, of course, at the one institute as well as a couple of other well-reputed places. So in conclusion, vaccination is the most important tool to control COVID-19 disease. Efficacy of the vaccine can be measured by neutralizing antibody tests. And neutralizing antibody level is the most viable measurement for vaccine effectiveness and immunity. According to Wikipedia, so, effectiveness is the capability of producing a desired result when the ability. Now, so serial testing over serial testing over a few months will give us the level of the antibodies. Either it's declining and when it reaches certain cutoff point, that person may require a booster dose. So neutralizing antibody tests will play a very, very vital role in how we manage the COVID-19 pandemic. And that's all. Thank you very much for your patient listening. All right. Thank you for sharing, Professor Rafik. I'm sure that we are pretty much cleared about the protective immunity by vaccination, also the potential application of neutralizing antibody tests followed by vaccination. Thank you again. Next, let's welcome Dr. Zhang to share his perspective on the society coexisting with the new corona, Japanese corona research and policy. Dr. Zhang, you may start your speech now. Okay, uh, thank you everyone. Uh, please wait a moment. I will put my PowerPoint on. Can everyone see my PowerPoint? Yes. Okay. Uh, so thank you everyone today I will introduce Japanese research and policy uh, with, against this new coronavirus and how we should face this uh, pandemic. From the report until last week, uh, the new corona pandemic keeps struggling in the world. In late 2020, America and Europe already be become the main battlefield together with new type of virus, which WHO recently named it to Alpha. WHO also picked out other three variants of uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus. The four brothers here were defined as variants of concerns. Although many other variants are still being monitored closely as variant of interests, the world situation of spread spreading seems climbing down slowly. New cases in America area decreased and the Southeast Asia remains low level increasement. Yet a dangerous new variant, Delta, contributed to the second peak of infection, reminded us of switch of uh, alarm must be still on. By vaccination rate keep rising, we should put more concerns on long-term struggling to, with this virus. To better understanding the SARS-CoV-2 uh, SARS virus, I here first introduce the structure of the virus uh, of this virus. Corona uh, 2 virus is a single strand positive sense RNA virus. The genome of SARS-CoV-2 virus share 78% sequence homology with SARS-1 virus. The SARS-CoV-2 virus genome is overlapped, uh, has overlapped the ORF, encoding four, sorry, encoding four major structure proteins, including spike glycoprotein, uh, nucleocuspid protein, membrane protein, and envelope protein, and some accessory pro other some set, some other accessory proteins. Its name came from the spike protein that uh, 
decorates the viral surface as extensive chrome. The S protein consists of two main subunits, S1 and S2. According to the genome map here, S1 subunit uh, contains N-terminal domain, which is a NTD, a receptor binding domain, which is RBD, a subdomain one, uh, SD1, and the subdomain two, SD2. The fusion peptide FP and the transmembrane TM are in membrane fusion subunit S2. Uh, I, I noticed that uh, some experts ask about the, what is RBD and what is NTD. I think you can find answer in my this uh, PowerPoint. When viral access to cell surface, spec protein will bind with host receptor S2, uh, and this will help uh, viral entry. Several steps are needed in SARS-CoV-2 virus life cycle. S2 and TMPR SS2 on host cell interact with spec protein, make viral fusion with cell membrane. After that, the viral genome was released into the host cytoplasm. Host cell ribosome will catch genome RNAs, translate PP1A and PP1AB proteins from main ORFs. Further synthesis of a genome RNA will help produce viral proteins. Transmitted by ER Golgi network, new variants will be assembled together with a nucleocapsid and RNA genome, finally released outside to form a new virus. Let's check this, uh, this map here. The entry step is most important to a successful infection. As the key in this map, spec protein needs to undergo a conformational trans transition to expose the internal fusion peptide. The exposed fusion peptide promotes either cytoplasmic or endosomal membrane fusion. Three categories of uh, proteases are required for fusion and entry. The cryo-EM figure in the uh, red side shows that up more of RBD in spec protein can activate uh, attachment with S2 receptor. First, the S spec protein is primed by uh, TMPRSS2 offering cleavage at the S1, S2 site to produce S1 and the S2 subunit. The S1 subunit comprised of the RBD contributes to binding with S2 receptor on the target cells and stabilized the pre-fusion state of the membrane anchored S2 subunit. Then the HR1 and HR2 of the S2 subunit uh, gradually approach each other and form a six helix bottle, which is called 6HB. This causes the viral envelope and host cell membrane to complete fusion. As above mentioned, so many steps needed for sars corona 2 replication. It is, uh, sorry. It is uh, steadily mutated during co continuously transmit among humans, especially in spec protein. D614G, now it's called alpha, is the first famous variant uh, responsible for worldwide infection. It was first reported in the Great Britain and reached USA in early April. Experiments using pseudotype virus found that alpha had a higher titer. In infected individuals, alpha is associated with lower RT-PCR circled transients, 
suggestive of higher upper uh, respiratory uh, tract viral loads, but not increase the disease uh, severity. Alpha was more infectious than the uh, ancestral form on human lung cells, colon cells, and on cells expressing human S2 or S2 orthologs from various mammals. Alpha did not have uh, uh, a large spike protein synthesis uh, processing or in cooperation with such coronavirus 2 particles. Assessment of the S protein trimer of uh, cryo electron microscopy showed that alpha distributes uh, an inter, inter promoter. Sorry, uh, here. Yes, uh, the inter promoter and uh, is switched toward an S2 bending. Uh, competent state, which is modeled to be on pathway of viral membrane fusion with target cells. Neutralization potency of antibodies targeting the spike protein receptor binding domain was not attenuated. So our group also processed uh, works on alpha. We created plasmid expressing five different spec variants that were initially identified in China. Here is uh, H49Y, uh, Europe V367F and D614G, and the United States uh, G476S and V483A, and examined the efforts of these mutations on entry into cells, uh, expression S2 uh, and uh, TMP RSS2. By compar uh, comparison uh, with that of wild type S protein, uh, remar remarkably, the alpha mutant displayed the highest level of entry activity among natural mutant spike protein test tested here. Our results also indicate that the SARS-CoV-2 virus mediated entry into cells is more highly dependent on uh, TMPRSS2 co-expression than that of SARS-CoV-2 virus. So we also performed structural analysis on uh, complex models between S2 and spike proteins. Notably, uh, the wild type, uh, which is D60, uh, D614, is able to form a hydrogen bond with a therine residue T859 and or a salt bridge with a lysine residue K856, uh, K854 located in S2 subunit. The mutation of this residue to a uh, glycine can provide flexible space between two promoters due to the short side chain, allowing the S1 subunit to be disassociated with smoothly from the S2 subunit, and or likely providing conformational flexible, uh, flexibility to the overall structures of S trimer, which might lead to improved affinity of is two. Biolayer interferomal uh, technology was used to uh, accurate measure the binding affinity of these spike proteins to S2. The results consisted with our spec. The recent reports from science uh, noted that an alpha spike protein A570D and S982A change of amino acids may help RBD of stack protein remains contain a certain position. Also, N501Y change increased the affinity to S2 receptor. In beta virus, 
spike protein largely retains the structure of uh, the G614 trimer and has almost the same biochemistry st uh, stability. N501Y, K417N, and E484K mutation did not uh, cause major structural changes. However, the loss of a salt bridge between K417 and S2 uh, aspirin uh, 30 and GLU484 and S lice 31. Uh, elevated the uh, increase in receptor affinity confirmed by N501Y and K417N and E484K may cause antibody targeted RBD uh, epitopes to lose their bending and neutralizing effects. The beta variant is likely to be selected under a certain level of immune pressure. So the gamma virus has uh, 17 unique amino acid changes, 10 of which are present in spike protein. Contains three most worrying variants, which is mentioned above as N501Y, E484K, and K417T. Recent reported Delta virus originated from India and uh, ravaged the entire South Asia. The latest research showed that the P618R mutation is highly preserved in the ligate. And this mutation can promote uh, fury mediated cleavage of, of spec protein, accelerate cell free fusion and promote uh, the escape ability toward uh, neutralizing antibodies. For different virus variants, the de development of uh, existing vaccines has also attracted wild, uh, wild public attention. What well-known primary companies have launched different types, uh, types of vaccines. According to the latest uh, statistic, Pfizer has the best performance in uh, preventing four variants. For the emerging species Delta, the effect of the vaccine still needs to be discussed. Uh, to codify uh, spike mediate cell entry, our group employed a new a novel uh, normal normalization system of cell entry. The system results in enhanced experimental accelerate uh, in a single round replication assay. Also here, uh, a paper demonstrate that our lecture host today, Wonderful, uh, whose antigen test kit can detect all those four variants above, has reduced false negative, uh, negativity caused by mutation in detection domain. So the world's main vaccine types are RNA vaccine, vaccines, uh, viral vector vaccines, inactivated virus vaccines, recombinant uh, protein vaccines, and uh, virus-like particle vaccines. Because of time limits, uh, you can confirm this, the specific information in this form, and I will not introduce much here. Uh, but after this lecture, if you have questions, you can ask me and I will give you more details. Each vaccine has different targets. At present, uh, messenger RNA vaccines and the inactivated virus vaccines are mainly marketed. The goal is uh, to generate effective virus neutralizing, neutralizing antibodies, but uh, activate, uh, by activating the immune system. So the concept of the design of a vaccine is, used, is mainly dependent on the spike protein, uh, just like the uh, figure on the right side of my PowerPoint. Uh, 
you can see the different makers, uh, they target the different parts of a spike protein to design their vaccine. Compared to the international situation, Japanese vaccine development is also processing rapidly. The main types are recombinant uh, protein vaccine, um, messenger RNA vaccine, DNA vaccine, and inactivated virus particles. Basically, the joint development model of companies and scientific research institutions is adopted. And the government has also provided financial support. DNA vaccine has proceeded to the phase three clinical trial stage. Currently, Pfizer and the modern, Moderna uh, products are still being vac vaccinated for the public. So antibodies against the receptor binding domain, RBD, of the sars cov 2 spike protein uh, prevent sars cov one infection. However, the uh, Japanese research uh, group recently reported infection enhanced antibodies. By screening a series of anti spec monoclo monoclonal antibodies, from coronavirus disease patients. Some of antibodies against the N-terminal domain, NTD, induced the open confirmation of RBD and thus enhanced the banding uh, capacity of the spike protein to S2 and the infectivity of sars cov 2 Mutational analysis uh, revealed that all of the infectivity enhancing antibodies recognize a specific site on the NGD. Structural analysis uh, demonstrate that infective enhancing antibodies bind to NTD in a similar, uh, in a similar manner. The antibodies against this infective enhancing site were detected at high levels in uh, several patients. Moreover, we identified, identified it antibodies against the infective enhancing site uh, in uninfective donors, uh, albeit uh, lower frequency. These findings demonstrate that not only neutralizing antibodies but also enhancing antibodies are produced during SARS-CoV-2 infection, which give us a new point of view to design vaccine. By reconsider how they will in induce human immunity response. As of early July, the overall number of vaccinations in Japan is rising. Pfizer vaccine occupies the vast majority. The vaccination of medical staff is uh, carried out in an ordered manner. And uh, vaccination of the public ex uh, is expected to continue to grow. In many of the cases, the novel coronavirus does not transmit from uh, infected person to those around them. However, there exists several cases in which it is uh, suspected that single person spread the infection to many others. Furthermore, there have reported some clusters of patient outbreaks in some areas. In order to end this uh, epidemic as soon as possible, it is extremely important to prevent one cluster from developing another cluster. And the comprehensive measures uh, must be taken. It is also significantly important to uh, control the rate of increase in patients as much as possible through these uh, preventive measures to control the epidemic in Japan. Uh, the insurance of the emergency declaration has become an effective means of uh, intervention 
the goal of government inter, uh, intervention is to change the behavior of people, which is switch to a new lifestyle. For this reason, uh, the Japanese government has put towards suggestions to avoid gathering. At the same time, the increasing response cap uh, capacity of uh, medical institutions is required. The current infection situation in Japan is still not uh, optimistic. Uh, statistically, it is uh, experienced four peaks, but there is still an upward trend. What is interesting is that in the PCR testing statistics, uh, the proportion of uh, private institution is very large. The impact of the epidemic on the Japanese economy is obvious. There are some interesting data to share with you. First of all, there is a certain associate, association between the population movement to foreign countries and the number of infected persons which is uh, showed in green bar, uh, gray bars. At the same time, it can be seen that the movement across the country has slowed down significantly. Employment rates in uh, various industries have also declined over the same period, and only the beauty industry has increased. So compared with the same period to uh, 2019, 2019, the financial situation of companies is recovering. However, uh, the catering industry is still badly hit. Only the fast food industry seems better. Although there are still hard days waiting, we humans are leading in this competition against the virus. So again, thank you very much for hearing my uh, talk. So thank you. Thank you for sharing. Thank you, Dr. Zhang. There is no doubt that the occurrence of variants bring more challenges to public health in the epidemic battlefield. And thanks again for Dr. Zhang and his team's contribution to the variants research. Then we shall proceed to QA section. So here I got several questions for two experts from our audience. The first question is about the booster doses. So there are two audience uh, raised similar questions. The question is for Dr. Rafik. How will I know when and whether I should receive booster or not? That's a very difficult question to answer as of our scientific knowledge of today. Because we have started using these vaccines in clinical trials about nine or 10 months back. And we are seeing very few, of course, breakthrough infections. Those people who have been fully vaccinated, few of them, we cannot really say how many, but few of them also get the infection and suffer from mild to moderate disease. The most important part of the vaccine's efficacy is that it reduces the severe disease, the disease that require hospitalization, assisted oxygenation, or the disease that leads to death. So that level of protection is seen over a longer period of time. Now, when to give a booster dose, again, we have started these neutralization, neutralizing antibodies quantitative test over last few months, couple of months. So we cannot really measure and say the cutoff points for, the, so for somebody to get a booster dose. It will require a lot of international efforts 
particularly for those who are developing the neutralization assays or tests to have a standard uniform platform for measurement as well as reporting some people are reporting in uh, other units like international units some people are reporting in arbitrary units some people are reporting in micro international units so everybody who is developing the neutralization tests or neutralization assays they have to come to a conclusion of universal method of testing as well as universal method of measurement then over a few months time we will be able to find out that which is the minimum level required for somebody to get 100% protection from covid infection or so on and so forth so maybe this is too early a question for me to respond to maybe dr zeng can throw some more light on it Okay, thank you, Dr. Rafiq. So what is your opinion, Dr. Zhang? Uh, about, uh, about the same question? Yes. Uh, so th there's a, a different situations in different countries, but uh, I think uh, I agree with the uh, professor's speech. And uh, now uh, we are, developing new kind of vaccines and uh, uh, neutralizing antibodies. Uh, this will make, uh, make us more uh, selectious to uh, treat against this virus. I, I think that we will be a uh, victory uh, in recent days and uh, not to last so long. Okay, thank you, Dr. Zhang. And there is a question uh, for Dr. Zhang. Yep. Uh, in your presentation, you mentioned about the enhancing antibody. Yes. So is there any way to avoid the effect on enhancing antibody? Mm, as the reports I have re received by now, uh, there is no mention about this uh, solution. I think uh, since the, anti the enhancing antibody is targeting the NTD uh, domain of the uh, virus aspect protein, uh, now we must use some uh, drugs that can uh, weaken the immunity response uh, to make this uh, cytokines or uh, some chemicals, immune immunochemicals to slowly uh, released by our immune, si immune system or, or not, since we cannot control uh, how to produce or unproduce the uh, enhancing antibodies uh, against NGD. This is still a hard question. I think that by now there is no uh, solutions for this part. Also for the vaccine design, uh, I want to, uh, uh, to say one more point that for the vaccine design, uh, since we are focusing uh, the spike protein, uh, such as a, a recombinant protein vaccine or uh, a, messenger, a messenger RNA protein, we are focusing on uh, the uh, spike protein. But by now, why Pfizer uh, vaccine is more effective in all four variants. That is because they are targeting the RBD. If uh, you, you are using the uh, recombinant protein uh, vaccine, maybe you will mistakenly uh, induce some antibodies against NTD. If that happens, that means that uh, the antibody will, will enhance the infection of virus, which it will be a kind of dangerous. Okay, I see. Thank you, Dr. Zhang. And another question is for Dr. Rafik. So what is the timeline you recommend on doing neutralizing antibody tests after vaccination? 
That's an interesting question. Again, our knowledge is quite limited of what is the best time to check for the neutralizing antibodies after vaccination. But uh, now there are the scientists have agreed on two things. One is the neutralizing antibodies test. It is ideal if available to test before starting the vaccine regime. And following the vaccine regime of two dose vaccine we are talking about, if a vaccine is a two dose vaccine, two weeks after the second dose of that vaccine is the uh, optimum time for the checking of the neutralizing antibodies. But very recently, few studies have come out which says that particularly with the messenger RNA vaccine, you can really look at the antibody levels after first dose, two to three weeks after the first dose of the vaccine, you can check the neutralizing antibodies and neutralizing antibodies reach a certain peak or plateau at two to three weeks after the first dose of the vaccine. So ideally, if there is a two dose vaccine, two weeks after the second dose, and for the messenger RNA vaccines, two to three weeks after even the first dose is okay. But of course, you have to monitor it over every three months or so to check for the decay of the antibody levels so that when there is a sharp decline to a certain level, perhaps we will over a period of time be able to make the recommendation and this is the level below which if the antibody level falls, then you will need the booster vaccine. But it is at least premature at this point. And as Dr. Zhang mentioned that we may need these boosters maybe over a period of one to two years. Okay, I see, thank you. And the next question is for both experts. As Dr. Zhang mentioned, there are four variants by far. We have uh, mutation alpha, beta, gamma, and delta variants. And those are causing worldwide spread, burden the healthcare system once again. So will COVID-19 keep evolving in the future? What are the impact of the mutation on pandemic control? And is there any strategy for variant control? Perhaps Dr. Zhang may answer the question first. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for uh, this question. This is a very good question. So to the variants, uh, what kind of variants will be the main variants in the future is unpredictable. Uh, since we have tried many methods like uh, using AI technology or some other technologies to, uh, to uh, try to find out what kind of uh, mutation will cause the more structural changes or some, uh, some deadly effect of this virus. But we feel of, uh, that because the, the, the genome information now is not, is not complete yet. And since the genome technology or the uh, protein structural analysis technology is still limited in our research field. So to, uh, we can only um, expect the possibility that maybe this kind of mutation will cause a, a great shape change of the protein structure, which can lead to, which may lead to uh, the infectivity increase, but we cannot say uh, for sure that it, this will happen. Also, um, there is an argument about uh, what is kind of a smart virus. What, what is a smart virus? A smart virus is like uh, influenza. I think uh, this, for this part, uh, Professor Kanye will be very familiar that like HIV or influenza, this kind of virus is very smart. They can coexist with the human beings, just like my title. So in the future, I think we will coexisting with the coronavirus too. 
And uh, finally, it will become some, uh, like Trump says, uh, the, some kind of influenza. But uh, we must uh, wait for that day. It still costs uh, years or months to achieve that uh, goals. Okay, now <clears throat> I think Professor Zheng has very rightly said the smart virus. In fact, people think that variants are bad, but this is not always so. Uh, so as far as the variants alpha, beta, gamma and delta concerned, very recently over the last uh, few weeks, there is another variant that's the lambda variant that is uh, spreading across the globe. And some of the attributes of these variants are favorable for human beings. And uh, probably we might, might come across some variants which will be very friendly to human being and they will be smart enough so they will survive for their own, own self as well as they will not cause damage to human health. So these will be smart variants. So some variants may erupt and start spreading across the globe and they will become part of our human beings genome. And, and that will be the time when perhaps we will be able to get rid of this SARS-CoV-2 virus, maybe through our own vaccination strategies, maybe through the recovery from the infection, or maybe through these variants, which lose some of the attributes which are responsible for their pathogenicity or high transmissibility. So let's hope for the best that these were some of these variants may not be able to harm us, but rather benefit us. As far as, of course, the harmful variants are concerned, we really are looking at the new antiviral targets, new antiviral medications, as well as the more effective vaccines. So the time will tell us that uh, which strategy is working the best. Thank you, Dr. Rafik, and thank you, Dr. Zhang. And due to the time limit, here is the last question. And this question is for Dr. Rafik. So if someone got infected with COVID-19 four months ago, should he or she get vaccination? And also, is it necessary to test the neutralizing antibody before the vaccination? Oh, well, that's an interesting question. So first of all, if somebody has got a natural infection of COVID-19, it is suggested that uh, just wait for about 30 days, one month, and check your neutralizing antibodies. If the neutralizing antibodies are at a sufficient level, then you may increase this waiting period from one month to up to three months, but do get vaccination done within first three months of the infection. But if the antibody level is low, then please don't wait further. Get the vaccination done 30 days after the natural infection. And if you cannot get this neutralization, uh, neutralizing antibody test done, then there are rules of thumb. That is, if the disease or infection was mild, wait for 30 days. If it was moderate, wait for 60 days. And if it was severe infection, then wait for 90 days for the vaccination. Thank both of you for answering those questions. Our QA session has to end here. Dr. Zhang and Professor Rafik did provide us with a lot of information and inspiring thoughts. One for Biotech keep working on to present the most satisfying and complete solution and products since the beginning of COVID-19. No matter for COVID-19 diagnosis or monitoring the neutralizing antibody level after vaccination. As you can see from this slide, One Force product list covers from diagnosis to post-vaccination screening. For diagnosis, we have RT-PCR antigen antibody test our RT-PCR assay targets on both regular coronavirus and identified variants. 
Room temperature storage and ready-to-use reagent can greatly improve the testing capacity. For antigen tests to meet requirements of different application scenario, we also provide test kits that are used by either professionals or laypersons with different sample types, including MP, OP, NISO, saliva, and sputum. And we also provide influenza and COVID-19 antigen combo tests to help the initial differentiation diagnosis accurately guide the further clinical decision. For antibody, we have testing kit that can detect total antibody tests, IgM and IgG, that based on colloidal Go platform and fine care fluorescent immunoassay platform. For post-vaccination screening, we provide RBD antibody and neutralizing antibody based on colloidal Go, fine care fluorescent and chemiluminescent platform respectively, which we hope could assist the vaccination program. One sentence to conclude, epidemic involves, one for also involves, and always try to be better. Again, thank Dr. Zhang and Professor Rafiq for sharing their insight with us. And special thanks to Professor Rafiq to join the webinar with us at 4 a.m. in the morning. Thank all the attendees for joining One for Biotech. We hope you learn and enjoy this webinar. Also thank One for Biotech and Renxin Association for presenting this webinar giving us this opportunity to have conversation with experts, experts in this field. And One for Biotech will host another webinar focusing on the emerging role of neutralizing antibody in COVID-19 pandemic on 22nd July. We are looking forward to your participation again. Also, you can follow the One for's official account on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook to acquire the latest information of One for. Lastly, we will have e-certificate sent to each of the attendees for showing our gratitude for your time and participation. For any questions you raised during the webinar, we will collect and deliver to our experts. And if you have further questions that would like to ask to experts or you are interested in one false products, you can contact us through the email on this slide. We will convey all your questions to our two, ex two experts and get back to you as soon as possible. See you next time. Thank you. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. And thank you everybody who participated. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.